Welcome to Bible and Brews, this week's edition, the first week that we're doing Hebrews. This is Pastor Frank Rafado, Redeemer Lutheran Church, Pastor Jamie Strickler, St. Timothy Lutheran Church, both in Charleston. However, today we're at Mountain Pies, Mountain Pie. which is in St. Albans, West Virginia, off McCorkle Avenue. That's right. Mountain Pies are known for their pizzas, and one of the most exotic things you can and get on their pizzas, their pies, the pies, pies. pies. Yeah. Yeah. One of my most exotic things you can get on their pie is a fried egg. You can get a fried egg on any sandwich. You can get a fried egg on any pizza. I, I personally, I love that. I think it would be awesome. Yeah, I do too. Well, I do that sometimes for breakfast. I'll grab a piece of pizza and put an egg on it for the microwave. Oh, there you go. Yeah. A little extra protein. Yeah, yeah. Also, we have before us the traditional West Virginia pepperoni rolls, which are sensational and they're more. That, by the way, beloved, is an appetizer. Far more than any meal, let alone an appetizer. Yeah, for, for a wee little man like me, that's a meal. So, uh. <laughs> but being by the end brews, mountain pies also have some has a various craft brews. And Pastor Frank, you tried a brew today. I, I did. I decided to try an adult brew this time. Not, not the coffee isn't at all, but I, you know. And so I want to make sure I get this right. This is this is from a local brewery. Um, it's a West Virginia brewery called High Ground Brewing. Terra Alta, West Virginia, which is apparently on the outskirts of Morgantown. And I had the Coltrane Baltic Porter. Coltrane and Baltic Baltic Porter. And so, in a word, I would describe it as robust, flavorful, robust. Okay, that's two words. Um, <laughs> well, I see that it's 7.6% alcohol, so well, you probably don't want to have too many. I see you're nursing. No, no. Yes, I, I nurse it. I had one, one with a meal, and uh, I nurse it. So, yes, that's exactly right. And with all those pepperoni rolls, I think you're probably safe. Yes. <laughs> well, you can see behind us we have a little scenery today. It's the first time we've been on the patio. Uh, well, we've been in a patio, Panera Bread, but you didn't get the scenery. No. Behind us we have the Appalachian Mountains, and for those of you in Iowa and Nebraska, I know we say Appalachian. However, here in Appalachia they say Appalachia, Appalachia and they're adamant about such a thing, so they're the Appalachian Mountains. Also, we have the Kanawha River. Are you sure that's not Kanawha? It's spelled Kanawha, but uh, Siri likes to say Kanawha. Siri is not from West Virginia. No. So and in West Kanawha. Virginia they say Kanawha. Kanawha. And inc inc incidentally, we are in and my kids go to Kanawha County School. So we've got some scenery today out on the patio. It's rather humid out here. We've had some rain here, and I know that you in the Midwest would covet the rain that we've had. But we have some rain in the mountains. Mr. Frank, what do you know about the background and the setting of Hebrews? Well, I'm glad you, that you asked. Um, not as not as much as I should know, but I do know some stuff that we want to share today. And so today, as you all know, we usually start giving back a little bit of backdrop from the last lesson, a little reminder. Since this is lesson one, what we're going to do is give a little background to the book, a little bit of things we want to consider as we read and go through the text. So, first of all, this this was probably written a little bit before uh, Jerusalem fell in eighty seven. When the Romans sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple and all of that, um, its purpose is, to, is for exhortation to encourage the brothers in the faith, especially those who were Jewish Christians, because not only were they facing sort of persecution from the secular side from Rome, but from their fellow Jewish folks. And so these Hebrews, these Hebrew Christians, were facing it. And so, so part of it is we're going to see. Um, that uh, law and gospel themes, and that's shocking, right? <laughs> so, law themes, retribution for dis disobedience, slavery to death and the devil, uh, an unbelieving heart, rebellion, obligation to sacrifice, um, repentance from dead works, that kind of thing. So, um, for the gospel side, what, we, what we've got the good news is, God's final word is Jesus. That's his fun. God spoke through Jesus. We've got purification for sin. We inherit salvation. Jesus is our high priest and mediator. And, and what the author is going to do is say, oh, look how great these Old, the Old Testament covenant was and these rites and ceremonies. But how much more 
Jesus in fulfilling them brings glory to God. The Old Testament they lay the archetypes, things that are kind of the types, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that point to what Jesus fulfills in the New, New Testament, that is the actual thing. And so in about this time, about 60 AD-ish, uh, the, the Jews decide that they are tired of the Christians. The Christianity up to this point, or the way, was considered an extension of Judaism. And so the Jews expel the Christians from the synagogue and they, they destroy the Church of Jerusalem. And at this time, the Church of Jerusalem was the home church. This is where Paul goes to make sure that he's teaching his Orthodox. He's commissioned by the disciples and sent to plant churches in Asia Minor. Then all of the collections that Paul takes up goes back to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem dispenses them then to the churches as they meet. <clears throat> well, they, uh, the, the Jewish temple guard come and destroy the Church of Jerusalem, and James, the actual brother of Jesus, the Bishop of Jerusalem then is forced off a cliff and dies a martyr's death. The Jews and Christians then are forced to scatter into the outlying areas. Uh, for more on that, you can read First Peter. First Peter is his address to and his encouragement to those Jerusalem Christians that have been scattered because the home church has been destroyed. Then later in history, uh, Christianity will be centered then in Rome in the west and in Constantinople in the east. Right. But for this time in history, uh, there's, there's uh, all kinds of persecution, there's some needs for encouragement. Hebrews does a great job of taking the Old Testament and tying it to the New and putting the two together. Yeah, so it's going to be a, a stark rendering of what the Christian message is. Unlike the, like the prosperity message of today that many give, this is going to show, hey, wait a minute, the cross is at the center of things. Starting in Revelation. Yeah. Or in, in Genesis. In Genesis. In Indian right. Revelation. This is the Christian message from yeah. Genesis to Revelation. So, um, so there's a great blessing that hopefully we will get out of that, and that's this. In this letter to the Hebrews, in this sermon to the Hebrews. Yeah, this isn't an epistle. This is one sermon. This whole book is one sermon. And by the way, there's a lot of Harley guys that like to come here and have the craft brews and ride their motorcycles, and it's a great place to bring there as well. <laughs> I'm born sure he's to be, a biker for Jesus. I'm born, sure. born to be wild. Born to I be was wild. going to sing that, but I'm not going to do it. And wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Wild and wonderful. Wild there and goes. wonderful. Okay, so let me say, this, this this sermon to the Hebrews is a blessing, and, and hopefully what we'll learn out of this is to have a greater appreciation for the Old Testament, how the Old Testament still applies to our life in a sense, reflect the changes that Jesus has brought about when he fulfilled the laws and the promises of the Old Covenant, um, and then we're going to take note about how all of Holy Scripture bears witness to this great work, which Jesus accomplished on the cross, gaining our salvation, and that He stands now in heaven interceding for us even now. And so that's, that's in these next 13 weeks going through Hebrews, I, this is just a great book. Really. Absolutely. Yeah. So we look at Lesson 1, and it's entitled, Focus on the Sun. And we're missing a little sun today. It's very, very overcast. Oh, oh no, it's the other sun. But the other oh, S O N. S O N. Yes. Focus on the sun. That would be Jesus. Yes. And it covers Hebrews chapter one. Our theme verse is Hebrews chapter one, verse two. In these last days, God has spoken to us by His Son, through whom He made the universe. So through Jesus, all things were made. There wasn't anything that was made that didn't come through Jesus. That's right. And in these last days, we heard some locusts out here earlier. thinking that maybe we're in the last days. Well, the author of Hebrews says that the last days started when? Jesus. When Jesus came, right? And so we have the last days being from when Jesus came until he comes again. In contrast to some of these uh, John Nelson Darby followers who in the 1800s rewrote this whole dispensational premillennial garbage about uh, Revelation. The end days are from the time when Jesus is comes into existence in the flesh, not into existence, excuse me, comes in the flesh until he comes in the car. Which, which people kind of, they're, they're debate about when that actually starts, or, you know, yeah. is it at the resurrection? I the resurrection. And then, I, for me, this is just a personal opinion thing, is I think when Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, he's letting us know. It, the kingdom is being ushered in and the, and the last days are starting. And, and so I was asked today, Pastor, do you think we're close to the end times? Do you think we're close to the last of days? And I said, absolutely, we're closer yeah. than we were 100 years ago. And not because of the pandemic, <laughs> not because of the tomfoolery and politics, because there's always been that stuff. It's always been that So ever since the fall, but yes. We are, we are just how time works. We are closer today than we were 
And so yesterday, immediately, and we're closer now than we were five seconds ago. Yeah, that's right. So yes, we're in the end times, and we're getting closer. <laughs> well, the goal of the study then is through the study of the first chapter of Hebrews. We pray that the Holy Spirit may help us identify Jesus as God, the only Son, the one who was promised and who appeared on earth to show us the Father, recognizing that when we see Jesus, we see the Father, and find special help and comfort in seeing Jesus as the Lord of all. So it's all about Jesus. You can Jesus. put it in, to put it in a phrase. It's all about Jesus. 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 So, Pastor yes. Frank, what's going on here? Well, what's going on? What's going on? Jesus. 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 Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Jesus. Well, going on all thirteen chapters of this letter speak to this one issue: that Christ, that Jesus, is superior in every way. In fact, throughout the centuries, God used the prophets to speak whenever He had a message to deliver. People looked upon the prophets with awe and oftentimes with fear, maybe even loathing. Sometimes, as God made their voice boxes divine means of communicating truth, again, they were loathed or unpopular. Yet, Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 1, tells us that these men spoke of the Holy Spirit. He empowered them to speak the truth without error. And so the word they spoke touched the hearts of people, and it still does. Uh, wait, Pastor Frank, I went to a very liberal seminary that said that each of the Bible books are influenced by their author, and the own author's interpretation of what's going on here are not divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. Are you saying that all the books of the Bible were inspired and influenced by the Holy Spirit? Well, That's very conservative theologically of you, Pastor. So I went through it's not merely conservative. It's biblical. It's true. And in fact, I can I can go with the folks who are standing in that seminary today, or I can go with what Peter just said. Who we know is scripture. So this is why, so this is important as we do go through scripture together to understand that part of our approach is that scripture interprets scripture, that, that scripture from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation, the whole thing is God's word. It doesn't contain God's word, it is God's word. And thus it has power. And so Yes. Are there paradoxes in it? Are there things that uh, are a little confusing to us? Are there things we have to wrestle with? Yes. But that's not the fault of the scripture. That's our fault. So this, hopefully this book is going to help with some of that. So, uh, to continue this, at the close of the New Testament era, the message of God to his people was complete. God had spoken a last time. Christ is the end of the message, the exclamation mark. He is God's last word to the world. It's like that game show, right? What's, what's your, is that your last? How to be a millionaire. Is yeah. that your final answer? Is that your final answer? This is God's final answer, Jesus Christ. So, many, uh, so he's, he's God's last word to the world, capital W word. Um, and so maybe people had revered the prophets. Now they were to focus on the Son of God and listen as they had never listened before. In Christ, God gives us his ultimate message. Words of salvation come from our majestic Lord who has supremacy over all things in heaven and earth. And you can find that in Colossians chapter one if you wanna double check that. Now in this first chapter, God does not speak primarily of prophets or of angels, but of Jesus. As important, as powerful as, as prophets and angels are, um, the Son of God is superior to all of them. That's the focus here. Um, so he is, Jesus then becomes and is the help, the aid, the comfort that God has provided for his people. And he can help anyone, even those who think they're being helped. So this is, there's lots of good news in this. And so we want to cling to him by the faith he's given to us. Um, let's not stray from it. So like Paul said in our Galatians lesson, how, how can you uh, leave the gospel? Let's not do it. Let's stick with it and, and let's walk through this together. And I think a key thing here is God has spoken one last time. There's an idea called dispensational. This idea that God is still speaking. God is still here, spoke here, spoke here. And he's still revealing to us his will. Now, if this were the case, if God were continue to come up with new revelations, that would mean what? That there's more books of the Bible to be written. We only know the canon is close. Well, and we're going to find this out in Scripture. Yes, in Scripture. So God has no new revelations. They have all been laid out in the Holy Scripture. So our text today is, is all of chapter 1. All of chapter 1. 14 verses. So bear with us. We're going to read through it. So I'll do 1 through 7. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago, in many... 
times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed to be heir of all things, through whom he created the world. He is the radiance of God, of the glory of God, and the exact imprint of his nature. Exact imprint of his nature. Holy cow. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majestic majesty of on high. Having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, "You are my son; today I have begotten you"? Or again, "I will be in I will be to the, him a father, and he shall be my son." And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, "Let all God's angels worship him." Of the angels, he said, he makes the angels, angels winds, and his ministers a flame of fire. So continuing in verse 8 here, but, at, but of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the, of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Or not... I'm sorry, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Ooh, man, that's jam-packed. Right <laughs> yeah, and this, the author here is quoting, he quotes the Old Testament. How many times do they quote the Old Testament? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Wait a minute, that means that the Old Testament was talking about Jesus? He quotes the Old Testament more than ten times. Wait a minute, does that mean the Old Testament was talking about Jesus? Well, it seems to me that he's talking about the glory of Jesus, and thus if he quotes the Old Testament ten times, he must therefore be saying the Old Testament is about Jesus. Jesus. Holy smokes, Batman. Revelation, <laughs> holy cow. <laughs> So our section now, so if I might say it, boom, boom, baby. <laughs> uh, sorry, we get a little excited about Jesus. Yeah, that's good stuff. Searching the scriptures. Question one says, verses two and three give a fascinating introduction to God's Son. Glean from these verses a seven, the seven statements that speak to mag, mag, magnify, magnificently, speak so magnificently of Jesus. Forgive me. Seven statements, so here we from go. two and three, that make magnificently speak of Jesus. Okay, so he's appointed the heir of all things. Spoken to us by his son. Um, uh, through whom he made the universe. The heir of all things. The radiance of God's glory. Oh, yeah. The exact heir. imprint of his nature. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's sustaining all things by his powerful word. That's a big one. Upholds the universe. That means that all the planets and the stars and all the, uh, the gravity of people staying on Earth, if Jesus did not uphold and sustain those things, yeah. and he does so how? By his word. His word is his power. That's amazing. Notice, and, oh, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, then for the next one, he provides purification for sins, which yes. only he can do, only God can do that. And then eventually he ended up at the right hand. The right hand of the majesty. Which is the seat of glory, by the way. Yes. Notice that all those statements speak also of God the Father. Knowing Christ is knowing God precisely as He is. Why did Jesus say? What did Jesus say about Himself and the Father in John chapter 10, verse 30 and 38? Jesus said, "I bet He says, I and the Father are one. I haven't looked yet, but I'm willing to bet that that's what it is." Verse 30. 30 says, I and the no, Father are one. one. So what's 38 say? 38 says, but if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, you may know and understand the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. So Jesus and the Father are one. Yeah. The Father is in Jesus, and he is in the Father. They're a unity. He doesn't say he's symbolically 
and the Father. No, and I and the Father are are our one. And this is important too because you have pseudo Christian sects like um, the Jehovah's Witnesses who say, well, Jesus is a created being. And and so when he says him and the Father one, it's just they agree. Like Jamie and I are one in the sense that hey, we agree with this stuff. But it's not the same thing. Or and Joseph and, Smith who says that the devil and Jesus are both sons of God and they're brothers. And an angel of the Lord with golden tablets that nobody ever saw that he had to put in a hat to translate. And the language is was never in existence. That's all but, but I would say this. So, you know, we, we sort of shake our heads and all that, but we get confronted with these things because Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses are very real out there and they're trying to convert people. Yes. So we want you to know the truth out of Scripture. So if somebody from Jehovah's Witness says that Jesus is a created being, you can point them to Colossians, for instance, and say, where it says that Jesus created all things. And there was not one thing through him which was not created. created. So the question you have to ask the Jehovah's Witness then is, does that mean Jesus created himself? So you can see where the, the thing is. So that would be difficult to do. That would be kind of a chicken and the egg controversy. It would. And here's the thing. Again, we want to focus on what Scripture actually says and does. Yes. We want to. We want to. Um, we want to be careful in our exegetical work in it, and um, we want to let it speak to us and not put our biases and put our things on it. It's hard to do because we're broken humans. But we want to do. We want to. We want to glean out of Scripture what it is. So, so this, these first two, or the verses two and three here, are very powerful about who Jesus is. Do you want to take question three, three there, Pastor? Frank? Yeah, in John 14, 9, let me pull that up. John 14, 9. John 14, 9 says this. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus almost sounds a little disappointed there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think I've read this verse before, like, you know, in every funeral I've ever preached. So Jesus assures the disciples that when they've seen him, they've seen the Father. So how do we see um, God, the Father, and Jesus? Well, <laughs> I can look at creation and know that Jesus had the hand in it. We know that his Father, as we profess in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And in Jesus, His only begotten Son, etc. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's that's kind of how um, I see it. By, by faith, we know that Jesus is doing all the things that the Father is doing. So they are in complete concert together. We confess in the Nicene Creed: God from God, life from life, very God from very God, begotten, not made of one being. This is something we confess. We've confessed. So I want to challenge you guys that by the end of this 13 weeks that you read the Athanasian Creed. Oh, yeah. If you're not sure what it is, look it up. Athanasian Creed. Um, we, a lot of churches will do it on, on Trinity Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it is kind of long, but it lays it out. It, it lays it out. So that's my challenge to you guys. Uh, question four. Intimate relationship exists between the Father and the Son. The writer quotes the Old Testament twice, Hebrews 1 5 and 1 13, to show that relationship. Which words shows that Jesus is superior to the angels and is God? Do you have that question right now? Yeah, for, for which the angels do God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? And then 13 says, And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? He's not giving any angels out of the way. No, and he's calling it. Jesus saying, I didn't say this to any angel. I said it to Jesus. You're my son. I also said to Jesus, the son, you are going to be set up on the throne and, and, the, and the enemies, you'll, put, you'll have your feet on your enemies. And so basically, that's the idea that the heel of Jesus will be crushing the snake. Yes, yeah, absolutely. My question five, Pastor Frank, do you have that one? Um, I do. Um, do me a favor, you read verse six there for them because they want us to read verse six and then I'm going to pull up Revelation here and again, they want us to compare. And again, when he begins the, the firstborn into the world, he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship. Okay, so in Revelation chapter 5, 11 through 13, it says this. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders 
the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the <laughs> Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And then 22, uh, chapter 22, verses 8 to 9 in Revelation, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the word of this book. Worship God. Worship God and worship God only. So if you notice, actually a lot of times, um, you know it's not Jesus, or, or you know it's just an angel, just an angel, but a divine being an angel in the Old Testament and other times when they appear to people and people bow down and I'll often say, no, 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 get up. Don't worship me. Don't worship me. Um, now Jesus tells them to get up, but that's out of grace, saying yes, right. we have, we're at peace. Yes. And uh, I guarantee you, um, believe me or not, if Jesus just showed up in the middle of this, we'd all be grabbing the, the concrete. Here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, and so, and rightfully so, he deserves that reverence. As uh, wet as it is God's with saying. Appalachian rain, yeah. we'd still be grabbing. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's right. So, so that really is. Um, he's saying God is telling us to, to worship only Him and His Son Jesus, uh, and by extension the Holy Spirit. So the Trinity is seen in worship. Question six. This chapter contains some of the greatest testimonies that Jesus is God. How does the writer show the goodness of Jesus in verse eight? Do you have verse eight? Verse eight yeah. Your throne, O God, will last forever. Righteousness will be the scepter. Those are the that's that's sort of the bookend of that here. So he he Jesus is king. He's monarch over. Right. In verse nine, then you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Okay, so he, he set you above your companions, which I'm reading that again as angels there. Yes, sir. Okay. Have other heavenly beings that aren't. Uh, verse 10? Verse 10, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. So God is creator. And you know, um, throughout the eons, whatever the civilization was, they would they always, uh, well, for the most part, figured that whoever made this has got to be the God. Yeah. None of them thought, oh, hey, this is random chance. Right. That's, that's only postmodern folks who think it's random chance. So. <clears throat> 11 and 12, they will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. So he's eternal. He is the eternal one. Capital E, capital O. Absolutely. And he can roll him up, shove him under his arm, and walk away with him. That's right. He can do, yeah. So, so 13 and 14? 13 and 14, this is what we were talking about, where God tells Jesus, you sit at my right hand. And that's the, the right hand is, is power. You'll notice in the Old Testament, you know, God, God's mighty right hand wiped out the, the army or whatever. So that's, that's the, to be on the right hand side is the hand you're going to be on. So. 13 to 14. 13 to 14. Yeah, that is the oh, right. Yeah, excuse me. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 And they all, and, and they all, and not all ministering spirits sent out to serve oh, for yes. the sake of those who are the inherent right. So, and who sends them? God sends them. God sends them. Do you have question seven there, Pastor? Okay, question seven's got several, and I, I did a little work at it. I've got, I've got the verses here for us, awesome. for the ones we want to read. We might not want to read all these, mm -hmm. um, but we'll, we'll kind of give the gist of what it is. So, for instance, um, so first century Christians knew much about God's angels. They called them winds and flames of fire, referring to their swiftness, to their sweeping effect, which is beyond the control of people. Angels are also, as we just heard, quote, ministering spirits to render service to humans. Yet no matter how powerful, how sweeping, how swift they are, not one of the angels is as significant as the Son of God, Jesus. So in order to increase our knowledge of the angels, we want to um, 
you might want to take a little bit of notes or as you have the book, if you, you've got the book, just sort of look at these verses maybe after this lesson just to get a little more on this, um, especially to read them closer. So, so in Numbers 22, 21 through 35. What do, we, what do we learn about these creative beings in that one? Well, that they, um, well, that they come to bring a message. And they can do it through various ways. For instance, the mouth of a donkey. <laughs> and I'm not talking about me being a donkey. I am a donkey. But we're talking about an actual donkey. And it, and actually, it, certainly in the King James, we hear uh, Balaam's ass. Yes. Um, if you will. So Martin Luther said, "So as God spoke through the ass in the Old Testament, so He speaks through an ass for the today." Oh, that's me. So, so um, this is where they used the, the donkey to speak, so that uh, so that God's message on that would, would come through. What about Psalm 91? Psalm 91, 11 and 12. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now I seem to remember that being quoted by the devil. I think. Jesus' temptation. Jesus' temptation. And see, this is the misuse of Throw yourself down. Throw right yourself right. down. You won't get hurt. Because look, he says it right here. This is like when people use the, the, the most often... Uh, the text is so often abused. I can do all things through Christ who, you know, who strengthens me. So what that doesn't mean is that I can climb up on the top of this patio and jump down head first and be okay. Yeah, and be right. people have, you know, have that. Or, or frankly, it's not like, oh, I caught a football touchdown. I can do all things through Jesus. You know, no. What, what Paul's talking about in the context of that is I've been poor, I've been rich, I've had food, I've been hungry. I've been through the, and through all of it, it's Christ that's the center. Yes. So, um, and so we want to be careful. So, that, so how does that tie to this? Well, this is Satan used this in the long way, but it is true that he commands his angels. And in Matthew, we look at the the, the silver, parable of the silver, and the devil in Matthew 13. There, he sows the weeds amongst the wheat. Yes, and so the enemy sowed them, and that's the devil. Jesus says. The harvest is the end of the age. That's now. And the reapers are the angels. The angels are coming. So this is another one of those. And, I, and as I was looking at these before, I was thinking, you know, that whole Left Behind series. Ah, yes. How terrible that was. It was just completely awful. It's a great story. It just isn't biblically accurate. Oh, it's just, the theology is awful. And life, right? hashtag, life is too short for bad theology. Yes. Um, because we want, actually want to be the ones left behind. Because the reapers take out the bad and put them over there and then we're left behind so we want to be the left behind ones not yet so so that's what that one's about uh, so so the angels here that's what we learn about them they are going to participate in that in the last day then Luke chapter one. Oh, this is okay this is where an angel hold on somebody's going to call from an angel over there no. so yeah well, this was Luke appearing to Zechariah, John the Baptist, isn't it? Um, yes, this is, um, the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named, Na named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So here, actually the word for angel in the Greek New Testament can also mean messenger. Unbelievable. Right, unbelievable. So, so these, in this case, that's definitely what they were. They were bringing message uh, for that God's message, mind you, not just any message. First Corinthians 10. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, don't, nor grumble, as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, Paul, um, I'm not sure what he was talking about right there in Corinthians, but... I think he's talking about the fallen angels, the third yeah. angels that followed Lucifer. That's right. And grumbled. Yeah. That's right. They grumbled, and they were destroyed by the destroyer. Yes. So, the angel. Yes. Yeah. And then Hebrews chapter 1. Seven. He makes his angels wings and his ministers flame of fire. That's four, 7 and 14. And in fact, in, four, that's, uh, in 14, it's their ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. So these are all things we're learning about angels. This is what they do. So, so as we, we're going to be closing this out in the next few years, so this is one of those things that uh, bugs me. If you will, it's a pet peeve that's the I thought angels were little naked babies shooting arrows. You know, well, <laughs> not so much, huh? No. Um, here's the other thing when people go, oh, heaven, I mean, if somebody dies, and oh, heaven just gained another angel. No! no. <laughs>
People do not become and I will angels. Tell you, I, and I will tell you, when my first wife passed away, several people said that to me, and I know they meant well, but in the back of my head, I'm thinking that is not helpful in any way. Why would you step all? down as an inheritor of the kingdom of God, yeah. one with the Son, to be a lesser being an angel? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so folks, here's the thing: we are we are set higher than when the kingdom fully comes. We are set higher than the angels. They're serving us, and now that doesn't mean we're like, well, we're better than they. That no, it's the vocation, or it's the way God has set the role of us. And then finally, we have First Peter here, chapter one, verse twelve. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, and the things that they have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So we, even this idea of salvation and the New Testament story and all the things that were being revealed, the angels were waiting for that. They didn't know ahead of time, not like God did. So while they're heavenly beings, they don't have omniscience like God does. So then question eight, according to Hebrews 1 to 14, what do angels do? Uh, it says they are ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. So they're ministering spirits for our sake. Yeah, so they serve for the sake of the ones who believe in Jesus who inherit salvation. They serve believers. They serve believers who are on their way to heaven. So, Pastor Frank, do you have number nine? I do. Uh, yeah, there it is. Name some of the ways angels serve God's people. They protect us. They watch over us. There is spiritual warfare going on all around us. Um, I think Luther himself said, if you knew how many flaming darts were being thrown at you, you would rush to the communion table because that's where you get your sustenance. From. So the angels are around protecting us. They serve us, warn us about danger, uh, and that kind of thing. So they are, uh, again, ministering spirits to us. Question 10, then. What are some words from Hebrews 1 that emphasize that the Son rules over the angels? Um, angels uh, my notes, to, to make this a little quick, are, and my notes, I got verse 8 and verse 14 kind of going in on that. You know, to which one of the angels, as he said, sit in my right hand, right. my footstool, I mean, that's kind of just a... Yeah, absolutely. Do you have the next one, Pastor? What then is relation between the Son and the angels? Well, the angels are servants sent by Jesus. Jesus sends them to serve those for whom he died. Um, and so... And of course, there are different types of angels. There's the cherubim and the seraphim, and I think and the archangels. And archangels. So, then, so some of them are to guard the throne room, and some of them are to worship God, and the others then are the messengers. Okay. And the cherubim were over the ark, right? Right. Yep. Um, and and so now, in a sense, <laughs> and again, I'm just doing a visual here. When we come to the communion table, and and we are gathered around there, we can also think of a sense that we're being connected. Um, uh, vertically, uh, it, uh, since heaven has come down, so we can imagine all the believers, all the saints that have come before, and the angels around the thrones. That's what we're doing. I mean, which is why our communion rail is half a circle. The tradition being that the other half of the circle is in the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, it's a foretaste of the feast it's to come, come, the marriage feast yes. when we're united. But this also harkens to Jesus as Jacob's ladder. Jesus is the one the angels ascend and descend upon to heaven and back, because Jesus has command over all. And uh, question 12. In verse 10 to 12, some of the qualities of God are named and applied to Jesus to tell us he is God. List of those qualities. Oh. So 10 to 12. So 10. Lay the foundation of the earth. So it's creator. Heaven and the, and the, the heavens and the earth are the work of your hand. So, so creator. Right? We talked about that. Right? Um, second, it's... Uh, They'll perish, but you'll remain now where of the garment. Your years will have no end. So eternal. eternal. So creator, eternal. Well, if he's able to do that, he's almighty. Yes. Right? And he's changeless. Jesus Christ is the same as today and today and forever. And do you have question 13 there? Okay, 13 now. In a few words, describe Jesus as, as you have seen him in this chapter. Well, this is Jesus in his full royal resurrected person. It, it, um, this, this is Jesus as king. Post resurrection. Yes. Yeah, he's yes. been resurrected. The work has been complete. This is, yes. this is all of Jesus. And, and here I want to I want to recommend to you because what a great question this is in a sense. 
because what do people do with Jesus? So many different things, you know. There's there's um, patriotic Jesus, there's uh, downtrodden Jesus, there's this Jesus and that. So I'm going to make a book plug here. Okay with you? Um, there's a book called Will the Real Jesus Please Stand Up? Twelve False Christs. It's by Reverend Matthew Richards, and you can get it at cph.org. And I would recommend it. We did a, we did a uh, study for Sunday School with the Quran, and it kind of goes through and talks about how people try to mold Jesus into what they want. To their own image. And I'm going to tell you, the more I read this, the more I want this one. Yeah. yeah. It's far greater than I could ever fathom. Yeah. yeah. So, the word for us. Just yes, grab that first one. How does God reveal divine truth through His Word? His word is his power. His word is relation to the Holy Spirit, of course, and true. Yes, and I'm not going to, I'm going to, this is sort of a paraphrase. In, in our, in the Book of Concord, in the, I think in the Oxford Confession, we hear that basically the only time God speaks to us is through word and sacrament. That's it. That's it. He does not reveal divine truth outside of the Bible. Um, now there is general revelation. I can look at those trees behind us and that river and think, wow, what great work. God, a creator. right, there's a creator, but this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about divine truth that is revealed to us, um, especially in terms of His Son. So, um, so as we said before, Jesus is the last word. <laughs> and so, uh, question two, how can you reply to people who claim that God is speaking to them? Yes. Well, <laughs> through word and second. Well, through word and second. But I think what the question's getting at is, hey, the Lord laid on my heart, or the Lord said to me, do this or do that. And here's the thing, um, I wouldn't, I would not engage in a big argument with people like that because it's just some foolishness. I think I would gently say, well, my understanding is that the way we know if we're heading in the right track of what God is saying is to see and check His word. And if what I think I'm supposed to do in situation A or B aligns with His Word, then yes, maybe God is prodding me, but He's doing it through His Word, you know. And, and if I cannot, I think I've shared this story with you, and I know I've shared it with my people, but I, I, I remember a time I was on a men's retreat, Saturday morning, pretty intense Thursday night, pretty intense Friday. Saturday morning, I'm sitting in the chapel, and I'm by myself, time of prayer, um, and I, I didn't hear a voice, but inside my head it was very clear. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Let's repent for the... Now, do I think God was, quote, speaking to me? No, but He brought through His Spirit, I think, the Word to me. Yes. And that's what I needed to hear. And at that point in my life, I didn't need to hear because I was at a point I needed to repent and to do that. And that's something we all have. So, I feel... I hate to put it this way, but I feel good about that encounter because yes. it matches with the word. Absolutely. It's not something that's it was the word itself. Yeah, it was it the word. Itself. That's right, and, and that's a promise Jesus gave that the Spirit would bring His word to our mind. So, so, and I don't share that to do this. It's just as an example. I think that's okay. So, if you're having that kind of thing where you a scripture comes to your mind, maybe God is trying to speak to you through that scripture. Absolutely. Okay, but but if you go, oh. Got laid on my heart that I should buy 12 dozen of this thing and go over and do that. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you just wanted to buy 12 dozen of the thing and go over and do that. Yeah, right, right. So, uh, just we just would be again, we're being cautious with God's yes. word because we'll fall in and He's perfect and we want to make sure we're in line with Him, not the other way around. You have question three there, Pastor? Okay. Question three. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Things mixed up a little bit. I do. Yeah. Question three says, you, you do it. There we go. Yeah. Here we go. What assurance do we get from verses 11 to 12 that God is and will remain in control of all things through His Son? Well, that He will not wear out, <laughs> right. and He's the same, and He'll have no end. Yeah, yes, he's, he's, a, he is the, he's the eternal one. Absolutely. How about question four? So this is related. The character of Jesus, according to verse 12, is changeless. What comfort does that give you when you're in the following circumstances? Well, I'm just going to peel these off, and I think you can know. When you're awakened at night by a terrible storm, when you're seeking the truth, when you're suffering an illness, <laughs> when you encounter members of cults, <laughs> when you hear about terrorism and threats of war, when you think of your own death, when you face unemployment or suffer disability, when you're enduring an economic crisis, when you anticipate a geographical move that will separate you from all of them. I think in all of these, the comfort is, is that while circumstances change, 
Jesus does not, and we can. He is our foundation, and we can always go to Him and cling to Him. Therefore, we find serenity, happiness, comfort, and everlasting joy in the promise of Jesus Christ, not into the circumstances of our life. That's right. That's right. So you know, I would. Um, the book here has got a little challenge or whatever. I don't know if you, any of you journal. I journal a little bit, not not as much as I. I'm not consistent with it. So they said, hey, maybe um, if you journal, you can kind of kind of keep a log of how the changeless Christ has helped you as the world around you changes and your circumstances come. Up. Good, good, bad, and ugly. Which situations does it cost me a Yeah. Question yeah. yeah. five, as you have faced other difficulties in life, to whom have you most often turned? Well, I'd like to say Jesus every time. I was supposed to say Jesus every time. Well, I am, so that is the answer it's supposed to be. But, but I confess that sometimes I've turned to other people or to my own rationality or to my emotions. Right. Yeah. Um, but the lesson, number six here, urges us turn to Jesus in everything. As Peter writes, you know, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. And in question seven, what assurance has helped you to know that this every that in every moment of life you can focus and depend upon Jesus? Memorize one of them. You know, regardless of I think the submission is regardless of the world's circumstances, Christ is the same yesterday and today. He is faithful. He's through whom all things were created, and therefore we've got our foundation and our sense of comfort and stability there. And in your situation, in real shorthand, he's God. Well, yeah, he's God. Sure. <laughs> so I mean, you don't get any higher in the hierarchy than exactly. that. Exactly. Right? He is God. Absolutely. Do you have a question eight? Yes. Yeah. Martin Luther's morning and evening prayers conclude with these words. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Um, name some other things angels can do for you, a believer in Christ. Or a believe, yes, a believer in Jesus. Well, again, they can bring warning. Mm -hmm. Prevent you from going into temptation. Yes. Um, protect us from the evil one and, and his minions. You know, the, the demons and the minions, the spiritual warfare that's going on around us, they would like nothing better than to drag us into it. And to, and to keep us away from Christ and the angels. Hey, we are set for the inheritance of the kingdom of God, and they are making sure that that happens. So, I mean, and they're not doing it on their own, their own authority. This is Jesus sent them and empowered them to do this. Question nine. Name some things angels cannot do for you. You may want to begin looking at John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish. And have eternal life. Have so, eternal life. the angels cannot save you. They can't save, they can't give us forgiveness. They can't die for you and atone for your sins. They can't give us eternal life. They can't make us right before God. Right. So, so in other words, the angels, while divine beings, cannot do... Can't work what, salvation. Can't do what God, only God can. Right. Right. More motorcycles. Frank, we need to get ourselves a couple of Harleys, I think. No, me either. No. I'd be terrified. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a motorcycle for a while, and it's been a long time since I've ridden it, and I think my days on that might be done. So. Scare me to death. <laughs> do you have question, question 10, you or me? I think uh, you might have that one. Question take it, bro. Think of some of the ways <laughs> Sorry. Think of some of the ways in which you will worship Jesus as you sharpen your focus on him. Take a moment to jot down some of the words that describe Jesus that which you can give him praise in your private worship. Then speak your praise to him in prayer as you focus on the Son. Well, you know, and Lord, by the way. Lord, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Well, and I think um, one of the things that's helpful is as you... It, for instance, in service on Sundays, when as we pray, we pray the collect of the day or whatever, and we kind of, I noticed this last Sunday because it kind of struck me. There were three prayers during the service that we said where we ended it. Like, For you reign with the sun, the sun, you know, and, and I thought, wham, we're being a little repetitive. Here. Oh, God, we, we, right. But it's a way to think about it now and forever. You know, God's holy, He's changeless, He's ever present. Yeah, eternal. Um, Again, these are things you can jot down, and you can pray these too. You know, there's that uh, acronym ACTS to pray, and, and the first thing is adoration. Tell God how awesome it is. Not because He's got a big ego and He needs it, because we need to remember it. 
He's, that's a gift he's given us to say. So we can say, you know, Jesus, you are holy and changeless. You're ever present. And so I come before you to confess my sins. In his name alone, salvation is That's right. To give you thanksgiving and to, and to solicit from you, you know, the things I need. Well, we kind of blew through a lot of information there. Yes, we did. But that's okay. So, um, so we're, we've hit the closing. We've got a little word here to, to if I can share it. Please. Um, so I'm going to encourage you all to pray that as a result of this study, God will have led you um, to conclude a few things. That the, the Bible is God's Word. And if you already believe that, great. And hopefully that will be strengthened. That Jesus is His last word to the world. So to the living word, Jesus, and the written word, Scripture, the last word. Jesus is not only the Son of God, but He is in every way God. So don't let anybody question you on that. He wasn't just a good teacher. Yep. He wasn't a lunatic. He wasn't a liar. He's Lord. He was an A Son of God. He is the A Son of God. And while we are living by faith in this world, we do not focus only on, quote, a God figure, but on Jesus. And we become very specific in our reference to God, that is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's what made me think of those prayers yes, yes, over yes. and over because that does need to be our focus. Absolutely. So, should we pray the closing prayer Let's together? Pray the closing prayer together. Dear, Dear Jesus, Jesus, in you, God, God made his final speech to the world, world. a beautiful a statement of his gracious and good will. You are, you are God. We worship you. You are, you are superior to all creation, and we submit to you. You are changeless. We depend on you to supply our every need in an ever-changing world. You died on the cross for our sins. Forgive us. You rose again on Easter morning. Give us your eternal life and peace. You ascended into heaven. Dispatch your holy angels to touch our physical needs. We pray all this in your name and by the power of the Holy Spirit. All right, folks. Lesson two next week, Hebrews. I cannot wait. I am excited. And he is brewing his word. He is brewing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you till then. Go in God's peace. The Surrender King. Thanks be to God.